Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank Penn for campaigning vigorously on behalf of myself and other people. And I'd like to thank the Palestinian um, club in SOAS as well for helping to organize this meeting. I'm a supporter of the Palestinian cause. Um, Five years ago, Thailand had a model democracy in terms of Southeast Asia. It wasn't perfect by any means, but it was thriving and developing. There was an active civil society, people campaigning for the poor, people campaigning on a whole number of issues. But today, the country is creeping back towards the totalitarianism that I knew in the 1960s, the totalitarianism of military governments. It's actually being controlled now, Thai society is being controlled by what I can only describe as um, a dark monster, the dark monster of the new order, Ruby of Mind, the new order that the so-called People's Alliance for Democracy, those people that closed down the airports wanted to see, and I'll talk a bit more about that. Now, five years ago, we had a government led by Thai Rak Thai Party under Thaksin Chinawat. Now, Thaksin is no angel. Um, I was forefront at <coughs> protesting against his abuses on human rights especially the war on drugs. 3,000 people were killed without trial under the Thaksin regime. Hundreds of people were murdered by the security forces in the south under the Thaksin regime. But we were able to protest against this. None of us were charged with les majest. And we could have carried on campaigning, but all that stopped with a military coup in September 2006. And I'd like to make it quite clear that those people who supported the military coup weren't particularly interested in supporting human rights. They weren't interested in campaigning against the war on drugs. And they weren't interested in protecting the rights of Muslim uh, Malay who lived in the three southern provinces. This is a picture from the military coup in 2006. And I think it's a very fitting picture because the military um, argued that they were staging a coup on behalf of the king. They argued that they were protecting the monarchy. And in arguing this, they were saying to everybody in Thailand, you cannot criticize us because if, we criti if you criticize us, you're criticizing the monarchy and therefore you can go to prison for Les Majesty. And this is the reason why I have been charged with Les Majesty. Now the military coup ripped up the, 2000, the um, 1997 constitution. This constitution wasn't perfect either. There are many things in it which I disagree with, but nevertheless it was one of the most progressive constitutions Thailand has ever had, with um, new rights of new bodies to actually supervise and um, to look into um, the actions of governments to involve more participation from um, the population. But this constitution was ripped up by the military immediately. They then appointed a parliament, a parliament of all their cronies. They also appointed people themselves to, onto boards of state enterprises. One of the most lucrative state enterprises, the airports authority. So um, basically, they claimed that they were staging a coup not only to protect the monarchy, but against the corruption of tax in Chinua. I find that rather ludicrous. Now, I'm not going to defend Thaksin. I'm not going to say that he wasn't corrupt. But the military have a very long history of corruption in Thailand. And the present military and the people that staged the coup were equally corrupt. And they lined their own pockets by appointing themselves to various positions. They 
eventually drafted a constitution. This constitution decreased the democratic space in Thailand. We used to have a fully elected Senate. Now half the Senate is appointed. And appointed by who? Well, their cronies, of course. And people in uh, so-called um, independent bodies and so on were going to be appointed by the cronies that had been appointed in the first place. So it's a, it's a bit of a merry-go-round. The courts appointed by the military and, and their cronies, the courts appointing people to the Senate, the Senate appointing people to the so-called independent bodies. That was something that the Constitution brought in. It increased the powers of unelected officials in Thailand. Equally, Interesting, this constitution wrote, it states in three parts that the Thai government must use the king's sufficiency economy and it must use neoliberalism. The two go together. Um, now, you may be wondering about what sufficiency economy is about. It's actually a crime to, to, act, to question the, the king's sufficiency economy because that would be deemed insulting the monarchy. But that's what I'm going to do now. The sufficiency economy states that people need to know their place. If you're rich, you can spend a lot. And if you're poor, you have to tailor your spending to your poverty so you don't get into debt. Well, you don't have to have a very large brain to come up with that kind of reactionary statement. The sufficiency economy is supposed to be a way out of an economic crisis. It's supposed to be a way to stop the poor um, going into debt. What they're really saying is the poor shouldn't spend money, then they wouldn't go into debt. They must be poor. They must starve. Their children must get lack books. The sufficiency economy is not an economic theory. It doesn't talk about the role of the state or the market or how to manage the economy. In effect, the sufficiency economy is an ideology. It's a right-wing reactionary ideology which says that the king can be sufficient in his multiple palaces and the fact that he owns large um, multinational corporations and that the poor have to be sufficient in their poverty. The Farmers in the fields have to be sufficient without a lack of proper investment. People working in factories have to be sufficient on the minimum wage. That's what it's about. And luckily, the people of Thailand are starting to understand that that's what it's about. They understand that the people that are telling them to be sufficient have never been sufficient themselves or have always been sufficient if you want to put it in another, in another way. The king has a swimming pool for his dog. A lot of people in Thailand don't have access to swimming pools. Many people in Thailand don't have access to proper equipped schools. That's the kind of thing that the sufficiency <coughs> economy is about. Instead of a sufficiency economy, we need a proper welfare state. We need progressive taxation on the rich, including on the royal family, on taxing, on all the um, millionaires, on the army generals and so on. We need to build a welfare state where Thai people become citizens. At the moment, Thai society is one where people are regarded as serfs, as servants of the king, as servants of the elite. Now, I'm coming back to the military coup in 2006. They drew up this constitution and then they called a referendum. Now it was illegal to campaign against the refer this referendum. People were actually arrested for campaigning against the referendum while the press were full of pictures and articles and um, advertisements urging people to vote for the constitution. In many provinces, the voting took place um, under martial law. Now, what helped all this situation, what helped the military to stage a coup, was the actions 
of the PAD, the misnamed People's Alliance for Democracy, the people that want to build a new order in Thailand, where the poor are disenfranchised from the vote, or that their votes count for much less than the votes of the middle class. Now here you see Sontin Lim Tongkun in the blue shirt hobnobbing with one of the leaders of the coup. Sontin Lim Tongkun is one of the leaders of the PAD. This was their uh, celebration party um, the new year after the coup. Um, as soon as the coup took place, the soldiers wearing royal ribbons would try to stop and search coaches coming into Bangkok to make sure that people didn't join demonstrations. They stopped people turning up to the Thai Social Forum that we organized two months after the coup. And this was the mass um, campaign to get people to vote for the military constitution. It only passed by a tiny majority which shows that really people were very unhappy with the constitution but perhaps they wanted to see elections. And when there were elections, Thaksin's party won again. But it had to change its name because the courts had been used as a political tool to dissolve Thai Rak Thai, so it had to change its name to Palang Pachachon. And the courts had been used a second time to dissolve Palang Pachachon and turn it into um, Pua Thai. Each time the Thai population have voted by overwhelming numbers for uh, the political party originally headed by Thaksin, each time the military and the courts and the people who stand to lose by Thailand modernizing have destroyed the um, governing party. Now, I think it's very difficult for people to understand if they weren't in Thailand or didn't understand Thai politics to really understand what the People's Alliance for Democracy is about. The People's Alliance for Democracy started out as a coalition um, made in hell. A coalition between right-wing um, royalist businessman Son Thich Lip Thong Kun, right-wing um, Jam Long Si Mueang, who is um, um, a reactionary Buddhist, he's against um, freedom for women to have abortions, he's um, against the religious freedom for other people. And this was a um, coalition between these two people and some leaders of the old social movements. People like um, trade union leader Song Sak, people like NGO leader Pipok Tong Chai and other people. But after the coup d'etat took place, this, all, this movement, which initially started out as an anti-Taksin movement, which only talked about Taksin's corruption, never really talked about human rights abuses, never really talked about making Thailand truly democratic, became more and more like a fascist movement. Now here you see people from the PAD, their armed guards, the guy with the purple bandana down below there is holding a gun and he used it to fire on people um, at the taxi community radio station and they're also holding up a picture of the king. So this kind of mob violence was taking place on the streets of Bangkok and you can understand really how they took over the airports because the airports are controlled by the army and the army allowed these people to take over the airports they allowed the, these people to take over government house which they wrecked they stole guns from government house they nearly started a war with Cambodia now when I was seven years old at school in Thailand there was a dispute between Thailand and Cambodia over a Cambodian temple built at the time of Angkor Wat on a hill on the border between Thailand and Cambodia. And the World Court decided quite rightly that it belonged to Cambodia. And you would think that that would have been the end of the issue. But no, the PAD dug up this issue 
whipped up nationalism, said this had to be Thai in order to bring down the government. And so you can see that the PAD, not only do they have armed guards, not only are they ultra-royalist, not only do they um, whip up nationalism, which has nothing to do with the lives of ordinary people, but their mass base is among the Thai middle class, the Thai middle class, especially in Bangkok, or sections of it. It doesn't represent the majority of the Thai electorate, 16 million of whom voted for Thai Rak Thai. And I have to say to you that I wasn't one of the 16 million who voted for Thai Rak Thai. I have never voted for Thai Rak Thai. Now, I think that we have seen a gradual erosion of democracy. We have seen the use in tandem of the mob violence of the PAD, the military staging a coup, the courts using um, their powers in order to dissolve political parties. And you've also seen behind maneuverings, uh, maneuverings behind the scenes by the military. In the end, after dissolving the government party for the second time, they managed to bribe and cajole a number of members of parliament whose backgrounds were hardly clean to change sides. And now we have a government led by the misnamed Democrat Party. Democrat Party Prime Minister Apisit Wechachiwa, for those of you who are not Thai, his first name means privilege. And he is privileged because he came from Eton and Oxford. Um, and his Minister of Finance is also privileged. He also came from Oxford and he came from a, a, a very wealthy background. Now, the Democrat Party government is both vicious and paranoid. Well, they have a right to be paranoid because they've never been elected um, as a from a majority of the Thai population. They're only there because of the military. They're only there because some of Thaksin's members of parliament who were more dubious were cajoled and bribed. But what do you think in December 2008 the priority of the new Democrat government ought to be? Now, uh, thousands of people losing their jobs in Thailand because of the economic crisis. But the priority of the Democrat Party government was to crack down on Les Majest. So their one and only priority is to make sure that they push along the Les Majesty laws. Now many people think that the Democrat Party government may not be really in control. The people who are really in control are the military. But this is probably true. But at the same time, I think it's worth noting that key Democratic, uh, Democrat members of parliament are pushing for the sentences on Les Majest to be increased from 15 years to 25 years. So these are, this is their priority. The Democrat Party have always opposed um, the use of public funds for welfare. They're very reluctant to stimulate the economy. They've just started to stimulate, to, to, to bring in a few measures to stimulate the economy. They're not going to be enough. And I don't think they really understand that they need to stimulate the economy. And why don't they understand? Because they represent the um, group of cronies in Thailand who think that they can ride roughshod over the Thai population. They were in charge in the 1997 economic crisis and their statement to the Thai population who were becoming unemployed in the Thai economic crisis in 1997 was go back to your villages and um, get help from your relatives. In other words, go and starve in the villages. Don't look for us for, a, for, for any help. And this is actually one of the reasons why when Thaksin put forward his um, new um, manifesto where he said that his government would look after everybody, he was immensely popular. This is again the, another, some more pictures of PAD violence. This is the PAD 
confronting the police outside Government House. And they had a big clash on the 7th of October, and the PAD fought with the police. They had bombs, they had arms, they had guns, they had sticks, and the police used tear gas. There were two deaths as a result of this. Now, if this had happened anywhere else in the world, the protesters would have been condemned, not necessarily for correct reasons, but in Thailand, everything is um, topsy-turvy. The people that got condemned for this protest were the police. They shouldn't have used tear gas to stop the PAD from preventing Parliament from opening. That was the opinion of the academics, it was the opinion of the mainstream Thai media. And this is what the PAD do to their opponents. This is pic take, uh, pictures taken by Thai PBS Public Service TV. Here we have someone from the PAD driving their pickup truck over a policeman. And guess what? No one from the PAD has been charged. But if Harry Nicolaides writes one sentence in his novel that may be something to do with the Crown Prince, he, went through, he goes to prison. He's in shackles. Eventually he gets released after months in prison. There's a guy now, Suwishai Takar, he's in prison awaiting trial. All he did was post something on the internet. But someone who ran over somebody else, people who use guns in the street, they're all roaming around free. And why are they doing that? Because the powers that be back these people. Today we have massive censorship. Websites are being closed down. Some of my web blogs are um, being blocked from Thailand, but of course people know how to get around these blocks. So we are play playing a um, cat and mouse game, if you like, with the Ministry of Censorship. There are a lot of people who are being traced by their computer IP numbers and they're being hauled off to jail. What we see today in Thailand as a result of the PAD, as a result of the military, as a result of the Democrat Party coming to power, is something way beyond any anti-democratic faults that Thaksin had. As I've said earlier, I was totally opposed to the human rights abuses of the Thaksin government, but this present regime goes way beyond that. We don't have any freedom of the press at all now. It is totally controlled by those in power. There is no transparency. There is no accountability. The reason why people are afraid of going to court for Les Majesty is because judges can decide what is and what isn't Les Majesty. And the, and the court proceedings are not really published in the paper. You're not the charges against people aren't really published in the paper. For newspapers to say that so-and-so was charged for Les Majesty for doing, saying this, this and this would mean that the editors of those newspapers would, would themselves be charged with Les Majesty. So there's no transparency, there's no accountability, and the judges are protected by a similar kind of law to Les Majesty, and that's the law of contempt of court. Anybody who criticizes a court ruling can be thrown into prison. The judges, of course, are unelected. Now, this is a very different way from the use of contempt of laws, uh, of court laws in Western Europe. Now, what is it that united the anti-taxing groupings? The people that supported the coup d'etat, the people that support the new order that the PAD won. Basically, they were afraid that their old privileges, the privileges that they were used to getting through their networks of nepotism, their networks of patron-client systems, their networks of the elite, the fact that they had power which was um, unaccountable. They were afraid that all these things were being challenged by the new boy, and the new boy was Taksin Chinua. Taksin Chinua was not 
and he's not a socialist. He's not even a Republican. He's an arch-royalist. But what he had in mind was that he wanted to modernize Thailand. He wanted to make the poor in Thailand stakeholders, if you like. Now, I hate that word because stakeholders is a, is a word which is used by neoliberals, people like um, Tony Blair and other people. But it's a lot better than thinking that the people are serfs of the king or that you can just ride roughshod over people. And that's what united the anti-Tuxin groupings. They felt that their privileges were going to disappear, that they would have to uh, stand for election in order to have power, because they were used to not having to do that. And what united them also was the way they looked at elections. Tuxin came up with a winning formula. The poor voted for him en masse. And why wouldn't they? Because the Tuxin government was the first government ever in Thailand to give everyone a universal health care scheme. Now, there are many middle class people in Thailand I've talked to who think, this is rubbish. Why, why, why would people want such a scheme, they think? These are people who never worried about their fathers or their mothers becoming sick or their sons or their daughters becoming sick. They never worried about hospital bills. They don't understand that this one policy, and there were more policies that helped the poor, actually transformed people's lives. So when people have illusions in Tuxin, and I don't, but when the red shirts do, then you have to understand that these illusions are based on reason. If a political party provided people with a universal health care system, a village fund to stimulate the economy and so on, then you can understand why they support that government. Now, I think we need to also ask who really is in charge in Thailand? Because if you talk to pe ordinary people today, people who voted for Thaksin, they will, they will tell you how bad things have become. They will tell you that the reactionaries are in control. And they will end that statement by saying, and we all know who is behind this. And what they mean is, they believe that the king is behind this all. They believe that the king has organized the coup. They believe that the king is pulling strings everywhere. And if you talk to the people in the PAD, if you talk to the people in the army, in the old elites, they will also make similar statements that the king is all-powerful. Whether they believe that or not is another matter. Now in Thailand, it may seem strange for people who live in Britain or Europe, but in Thailand it's difficult to know whether we have a feudal monarchy, an absolute monarchy under the capitalist system, or a constitutional monarchy under democracy. Because the um, mainstream view of the monarchy in Thailand is that it's a mixture of all these things. That the king has feudal rights. That the traffic can be stopped everywhere when he or his son or anybody else wants to travel. Of course in Thailand the traffic never stops for ambulances. No, never. Never stops for ambulances. But it will stop for royal processions. And uh, the traffic in Bangkok is very, very bad. So we have this, this situation where people don't really know what kind of monarchy they've got. And one person who asked this question, well, what kind of monarchy do we really have? Because in the Constitution, it says we have a constitutional monarchy. This man, Jagapop Penkar, he asked this question at the Foreign Correspondence Club. Guess what? He's been slapped with Les Majesty charges for just asking that one question. Now, in my book, I ask the question, why didn't the king defend democracy? He's a constitutional monarch. He should defend the constitution. He should stop the military from staging a coup. Why didn't he do that? Why, when the king said that he didn't have the power to sack Taksin, because a lot of people were calling for the king to sack Taksin, he said, no, I can't do that. Why, when there was a coup, did he then support the coup? 
He supported the coup by signing the papers appointing the Prime Minister from the coup d'etat. He praised the Prime Minister. A lot of people said that Prime Minister Surayut was a good guy. Now, Prime Minister Surayut in 1992, um, during an anti-military protest in the center of Bangkok, he was a military commander and he led a group of troops into the Royal Hotel in the center of Bangkok, which was a field hospital at the time, because the troops had been shooting people, unarmed demonstrators in the street. He led people in there and they kicked and walked over the uh, people lying down in this field hospital. This is the man that became Prime Minister after the coup d'etat in 2006. This is the man that everyone said was such a moral person. This is the man that the king um, defended and praised. So, what is it then about the king? I personally believe, and I've written academic papers about this, that the king of Thailand, King Pumipon, is not all powerful. I think that if you listen to him speaking, if you look at the way he behaves in public, he lacks the vision of a leader. He can't really come up with anything particularly um, new. He can't come up with leadership proposals and so on. But what he is used to is living with the military dictatorships. He is used to um, a uh, system where the military scratches back and he scratches their back. They all, they all gain benefit from having this vision of an all-powerful monarchy. I will put it to you that the present Thai king is someone who lacks character. He doesn't even have democratic principles. He's never stood up and said that Thailand should be a democracy. When he has said something, it is about the sufficiency economy, or to say that if Thai people have too much social welfare, they'll become lazy. And I think that it's very important that we talk about this. We talk about this, especially at a time when he's getting very old, and it looks like they want to put his son on the throne. His son is hated and feared by a lot of Thai people. His son is someone who has absolutely no respect for women. Now most people in Thailand have seen the video shots of the Thai king's son um, treating his present wife like a dog. He makes, he makes her eat out cake out of a plate on the floor while he's sitting there and she's completely naked and he's fully clothed. And he knows people are taking these pictures because there are servants in full uniform wandering around. That's just one little snapshot of the kind of thing that's going on in the, in the palace. Now, I think that the issue of succession is one issue, but I think the other issue is that for too long, the people around the palace, the people who really have power, the military, the conservative bureaucrats and so on, they have claimed legitimacy from the palace. After all, they can't claim any legitimacy from democracy because they never believed in it. So they are dead scared that this legitimacy is going to go down the toilet when the present king dies. And so this is one of the reasons why they want to crack down on Liz majesty. Now, I think the time has come for us to really talk about a welfare state in Thailand real democracy and to have a republic and this is why I have posted um, my Talangandang Siamdang or the Siam, Red Siam Declaration and people can read this on my website I'll put my website um, up in a minute there are also some copies outside both in Thai and in English that, that you can help yourself to I think that it's high time that we talked about these things. I think it's, it's very, very important. And I think that we have come to a stage in Thailand where a new civil society is growing up because the red shirts are organizing themselves against the royalists.
these are the red shirts. These are people who have contradictory ideas. Many of them love Thaksin. Some of them started out being organized by Thai politicians, but they've moved far beyond that now. They've moved to a situation where they have their own groupings from different provinces. This is a recent red shirt rally. So you can see that this is the rebirth of civil society. What about the old civil society? What about the NGOs? What about the social movements? Well, I'm sorry to say that they failed in terms of protecting Thai democracy. They, because of their lobby politics, because of the fact that they turned their back on a political analysis, because they were always trying to seek alliances with powerful people, they then got sucked in behind the fascist PAD. And I think that what we are seeing here with these red shirts is really the hope for Thai democracy. But it's, nothing is automatic, and it depends whether or not they're prepared to organize themselves, they're prepared to develop their politics, and they're prepared to open up to new ideas of equality. They're prepared to respect um, gays and lesbians. They're prepared to campaign for the rights for abortion. They're prepared to defend uh, migrant workers. These will be the key points of whether or not the red shirts can develop into a progressive movement in Thailand. I'll leave it here. Those are the anti-coup demonstrations earlier on. And that's the yellow shirts for you. Okay, I'll leave it here. If you don't know Thailand, you need to know that people have to crawl on the ground in front of the king and, on, and his relatives. Now, crawling on the ground is to show that you're subhuman because animals crawl along the ground. That's the kind of attitude that you have in Thai society, and we need to get rid of that, that kind of attitude. Now, will this be peaceful, or will it be violent? It's difficult to say. There is already a lot of violence in Thailand. I'm not, uh, I'm not advocating armed struggle. I'm advocating a mass uprising, but it takes a long time to organize this. I'm talking about building a red shirt party. I'm talking about building civil society. And I think that the polarization that's taking place in Thailand is actually a very good thing. Because un with polarization, you get choice. And with polarization, you get the red shirt movement, which is posing an alternative to the rotten system we have in Thailand. And so that's why I would choose to side with the Reds. And you have the right to criticize the monarchy. I mean, we can talk like this in Britain, but we can't talk like this in Thailand. Please. Um, a lot of people have said to me that they are, you know, they are decent uh, shirts, people who are sick and tired of taxing. Well, these people became sick and tired of taxing towards the end. They weren't people who were protesting against taxing when we were protesting against the human rights abuses. And I think it needs to be said that the PAD yellow shirts never <coughs> prioritize the issue of human rights abuses. After all, they wouldn't because they, don't, they actually think that what the government did in the South was right. The army generals, the, the police that are with the, the, the PAD, especially the army, they think that what they did in the South was right. So we haven't heard any yellow shirts talking about the a gross abuse of human rights under Thaksin. We haven't heard them condemn the coup d'etat. On, on the contrary, they supported the coup d'etat. We haven't heard them criticize what has come out of the leadership of the Yellow Shirts, and that's the new order. The first proposal from the PAD new Yellow Shirts was that 
parliament should only be 30% elected. And the reason for this is because the majority of the electorate were too stupid to be trusted with the vote. Now we haven't heard people who are yellow shirts in the PAD criticizing this. We haven't heard them stand up and say the issue of Khao Prawi Han on the border with Cambodia is ridiculous. We haven't heard them do anything. So I think that you know there may well be some well-meaning characters who found themselves with the yellow shirts, but they remain silent. How representative are my views of um, in, among the red-shirted people? Well, that's difficult to say, but I'm sure that I don't represent everybody in the red shirt movement because if I did, we would be on the brink of a uh, revolution right now in Thailand, and we're not. I think that what people felt when they read my manifesto was that yes, this is what everybody among the red shirts, or a lot of people, are thinking, but nobody actually wrote it down. So I didn't, you know, it didn't come out of some huge brain of mine, it came out of reflections of what people are actually thinking. And I think that it really went with the flow. People were really excited by it. Of course, the other side were frothing at the mouth, as I said in my manifesto that they would be doing. But I think a lot of people are very eager. They want to see a change in Thailand. They may not want to go as far as I want to go. In fact, I want to go beyond that manifesto and I want to build socialism in Thailand. But that manifesto is something I believe that the red shirts can unite around. Who's funding the red shirt movement? Well, I think that what's becoming more and more clear is these, there, are, there is an increased tendency for the red shirts to self-organize. They're not being funded by people. There are some people are being funded by old politicians. Some people may have received money from taxing. People keep... People have been accusing me of receiving money from Taksin for years and I'm still waiting for the money because at the moment <laughs> I, I don't have a, um, a job or, or anything. So if you see Taksin, tell him to send the check to me immediately. Um, uh, that was a joke by the way in case someone <laughs> turned <laughs> um, So one of the reasons I feel that the, the red shirts are part of a, a new civil society is the fact that they are, they tend, there is a tendency now to be self-funded. And actually it doesn't take a lot of money to organize politically. What it takes much more is, you know, developing ideas, organizing, getting uh, lists of names, producing um, media and stuff like that. That's the kind of thing that really is, is the difficult part. The money it's useful, but it, it's not everything. And I, and, and I think that in the case of the Assembly of the Poor, Samacha Kwon it wasn't really the, their lack of money that was the problem. It was their lack of politics, because they were fighting on single issues all the time, rather than general politics. So when one single issue got solved, a group of villagers would go home. And I think that, that I mean, we can go into that at, a, at another meeting, but I think that, that it isn't the issue of money that keeps that keeps the people fighting. But actually, the issue of man, who's funding the yellow shirts, I think is quite important. Because the difference between the yellow shirt demonstration or mass mobilization and the red shirt one is that the red shirt mobilizations usually take place at weekends. They last one day, maybe two, maximum. Because people have to go to work. The yellow-shirted people sat in the, the airports for days and days and days. They sat in government house for weeks. They clearly didn't have to go to work. Because if you'd done that, you'd be sacked from your job. So here you see you know, the different kind of people involved and, the different, and where did they get the money from if they didn't go to work. So I think, I think the issue of, of funding is very interesting in that sense. Um, Democracy now in Thailand, I think, has gone backwards to the point um, which is similar to after the 6th of October. It isn't quite the same, but it's similar. 
I think there is um, a lack of freedom of speech, a lack of academic freedom, there's fear, there's a lot of um, intimidation and so on. People signing petitions to stop the Death Majesty Law have had visits from soldiers, from government officials and police. They're clearly very um, determined to try and crack down on this, but the more they do it, the more angry people become. And of course, Thai democracy, um, you know, is it's something that we need to fight for. And British democracy isn't perfect either. Um, I spent a lot of time living in Britain. My comrades in the Socialist Workers' Party fight to expand the democratic space and freedom and rights um, in Britain. We're not under any illusions about the wonders of British democracy, and we certainly never supported uh, British government using um, um, armed force in Iraq or Afghanistan or, or, or in the colonial period. So it isn't a question of saying, you know, Britain wonderful, Thailand terrible. It's a question of saying that everybody throughout the world should have human dignity, should have freedom, should have equality, wherever you are. But it is a fact that we can have this discussion here in Britain because people have fought for democratic rights in Britain. And we can't have it in Thailand yet because people haven't yet succeeded in overthrowing the dictatorship that is now spreading its tentacles everywhere in Thai society. Why did I have to leave Thailand? Well, there are a number of reasons why I had to leave Thailand. I've told you that the courts, the, the total lack of transparency of the cases. I've told you that the courts have been used as political tools. So I wouldn't have got a fair trial, that's for a start. The judges will decide what is Les Majesty and what isn't. So they could easily decide that if I questioned the role of the king during the coup d'etat period, that was insulting the monarchy, 15 years in prison. Now you can't really organize and campaign from prison in Thailand. You can try, and I would have tried if I'd gone to prison but I can campaign much better here. People understand that back in Thailand. There's a second reason why I left Thailand, and that is because the old civil society remained completely silent about Les Majesty. The academics, the NGO movement, NGO coordinating committee, the National Human Rights Commission. I telephoned the head of the National Human Rights Commission myself, and he refused to do anything and incidentally Amnesty International also has refused to take up any Les Majesty cases in Thailand because they say it's too sensitive. Um, I thought they were about taking up sensitive cases. Um, and I, when I was campaigning on my case in a very political and high profile manner, my brother ex-Senator John Ngpapon said to me, if you campaign like this, nobody will help you. In other words, what he meant was that his friends in the um, NGO movement, his friends, some of them in the Democrat Party and so on, would not help me. Now, when you get a statement like that from your brother, you know that campaigning inside the country is not going to work for the moment. But the people that really stood up and were prepared to stand by my side were the red shirts, unconditionally. People came up and visited me. They came to the police station. They gave me flowers. These are the people who actually stood up for democracy. Now, I have never said in this room that the red shirts are pure Democrats who, who are leaning towards socialism. I've said that here you have a growing movement with all its contradictions, with its um, reactionary ideas mixed with its progressive ideas. And it's actually our job, if we want to see a better Thailand, to stand and move with these people, to try and make suggestions, to try and be part of uh, leading this movement towards a more progressive movement. And that's why I, stood, I stand with the red shirts unconditionally <coughs> as well. Um, was the sufficiency economy against greed? Well, on paper it might be, but some of the most greedy people in Thailand live in palaces. 
So I, I can't see how um, it can be against greed. I mean, it's easy to say, don't be greedy, but I'm going to, to rake in more and more money. Um, it's easy to hear government officials saying they're using the sufficiency economy and they've got three or four different salaries. It may be in, in, on paper say it's against greediness, but it doesn't have any effect on the rich. And that's why it really is about an ideology against the poor. It also claims a legitimacy from Buddhism. But Buddhism also, like most religions, is a double-edged sword. You can find teachings of, in Buddhism that say that people shouldn't oppress other people. People shouldn't exploit other people. But it, it is meaningless in a way, unless you actually put these things into practice. And in practice, the sufficiency economy was put as an alternative to social welfare in Thailand. Um, I've heard from many people that the king was a stabilizing force in Thailand. And what kind of stability is it about? It is the stability of the ruling elite to exploit and to murder and to um, oppress the Thai population. That's what stability is about. That's what um, you know, it means when you're talking about national security. It's also very funny to hear statements about the king being the stabilizing force in Thailand because I seem to remember that Thailand has had a whole string of coup d'etats. I seem to remember that Thailand was split down the middle in the 1970s and there, was a, uh, there were a number of bloodbaths that took place with the blessing, I may say, of the king. But let's forget the past. How about today? Last December, on the 4th of December, when the king always gives his speech, at a time of deep social crisis in Thailand, the king of Thailand, for the first time, cancelled his speech, claiming he had a sore throat. Well, somebody else could have read the speech for him. The next day, he was at a yachting tournament. His sore throat had got a lot better. So, where was the king performing his duty as a constitutional monarch. And if he can't do that, he doesn't deserve to be in position. He doesn't deserve anything. He deserves to be an ordinary citizen, in my view. If he can't do that one thing. How complicit is the king in all this? And I think that, well, I don't think the king is um, the most powerful person in Thailand. I think that the, the army and the elites are all hanging are on his coattails. They're all claiming legitimacy from, from the king to do what they want. Um, but I don't believe you know, that the generals went at gunpoint and said to the king, look, you've got to support the coup d'etat. I don't think they had to do that. In the transition period, anything can happen. But I think that the transition period is only important in that it de destabilizes the anti-democratic forces. It's not important in that it is a crisis for the majority of the Thai population. The majority of the Thai population are quite capable of working and developing the country. They're quite capable of educating themselves. They're quite capable of building Thailand into what it is today, without, with or without a monarchy. And I think that, you know, whether this king dies, whether the king's son comes to, becomes the next king, or whether we have a republic, um, will be, in the end, will be irrelevant to, to how Thailand develops. Because it's, a, it's, it's, it's more a question of how this institution is used by anti-democratic forces. If we can stop anti-democratic forces using this institution, then we can build a just and democratic society in Thailand. I don't really have proper academic debate. Myself and some of my colleagues in the universities have had to fight tooth and nail to have courses for first year students in the Faculty of Political Science where we train people, students, to write argumentative essays. Because the, the normal way to educate people 
is to tell them that you've got to write a descriptive essay uh, giving only the point of view of the elite. And to, to actually say you've got to write an essay where you give two opposing points of view and then you've got to take one side or the other and it doesn't matter which is actually very explosive in Thai and that shows the underdevelopment of academic life in Thailand. We can't really have debates with people. Academics don't read each other's work if they disagree with each other. If you have an argument, it's taken as a personal dis uh, uh, disagreement. And that leads to idiocy. And that's what Les Majeste is about. It's about building a society of idiots who can't, are not allowed to say what is the truth. You know, we're not allowed to say, hey, hang on, is it really true that the king is a top musician? Uh, have you all heard his, his work? You know, up there with Mozart and Beethoven, no doubt. Is it really true that nobody in Thailand can read a map except the king? Is it really true that he invented uh, the seeding of clouds to make rain? That's what we're told. The king of Thailand invented this. Um, wasn't anybody else. Is it really true? You know, we could go on and on and on. And of course it's not true. But it's not necessary if you're in a constitutional monarch. You don't have to have a super non-human god. You don't have to have that. But their majesty means that we're, we're supposed to believe all this nonsense. And, as I said, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a climate which breeds idiocy. But luckily, um, most of the idiots are up there, um, around the palace and so on. And actually, the majority of Thai people know damn well what the truth is. But they're afraid, and they're quite right to be afraid. And hopefully, they won't be so afraid in the future. Little me here is not going to be able to tell the red shirts what to do. I'm not going to be able to tell them, oh, you've got to stop loving taxi. You know, it doesn't work like that. And I haven't got the right to do that. But what I have got the right to do is make suggestions about how we should build a party. And people will t in, uh, agree with them or disagree with them. And I have to come to this.